Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we are creating tiny ocean replicas in order to understand how climate change will affect coral reefs and to see what these reefs will look like in the next century, 100 years from now. Graduate student Nicholas Evanson is using the laboratories at the Gump Research Station on the island of Morea in French Polynesia to study how ocean acidification affects the interaction of corals with each other. So Nick, I'm here to learn about the research that you're doing. Can you tell me about your project? A lot of the work that we focus on out here is looking at various parts of the reef ecosystem, so corals, fish, other invertebrates, and my particular side of it is looking at uh, the effects of ocean acidification on how it affects these organisms and their interactions with each other. So that's the main focus that we do out here, is looking at how future climatic conditions may impact the reef ecosystem. And how are you doing that? We collect corals out on the reef and we bring them back and we put them into mesocosms or flumes, we have different setups, that uh, allow us to control the seawater chemistry and by doing that we can try and represent um, what we think, what is predicted to be the conditions at the end of the century and so we can manipulate and control the conditions in that way. Okay, I have to ask, what's a mesocosm? Mesocosm is a fancy word for a tank, basically. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's the tanks that we have here are about 150 liter tanks and we can control the light the turnover rate of water in them, the temperature, and also we bubble CO2 into them to um, lower the pH and, and have some sort of conditions that we expect to have at the end of the century. Can we take a look? We can. All yeah. right. We have a 12 tank set up in here. Um, right now there are eight working. And as you can see inside of them, we have coral and algae, and uh, these are the main organisms that we tend to work with. And the current work that we're doing uh, is looking at coral-algal interactions. When corals and, al and algae interact, they compete for space, usually on the reef. There's been a decreased coral cover worldwide recently with um, increased pollution, various other stresses related to climate change that have meant that there's a lot more macroalgae present on the reef. And so we're trying to look at to see if um, there, what part of the dynamics between corals and algae is changing and why there might be the changing conditions might be favoring algae over coral. So how does working in this microcosm help you to understand that? The, the key thing is being able to control the conditions. So obviously the ideal would be to work out on the reef and we're currently trying to transition into that. Uh, but it's, it's a a lot of money to try and come up with the equipment to work straight out on the reef. And so here we can, uh, at the back, we're bubbling in CO2. So it's, you can see some bubbles coming out there. And that allows us to lower the pH. And every day we monitor the conditions of the tank and we, we uh, analyze the seawater chemistry to be able to see if we're at the uh, pH levels that we're looking for. And so we can have the organisms in very controlled environments and we know what we're looking at and what they're being subjected to. And so you said you're, you're adding CO2 to bring the pH down. Why don't you just add some acid or something like that? Um, acid changes other aspects of the seawater chemistry that we don't want to change. So bubbling in CO2 is, is the most realistic way to, to mimic what is expected to be at the end of the century because Ultimately, the reason behind ocean acidification is the, ex the extra CO2 in the atmosphere from pollution um, is being absorbed by the oceans, and that's basically what we're doing here, is, is bubbling extra CO2 in to, to mimic that, that change in the seawater chemistry that should be experienced in 50 or 100 years from now. And so is each of these tanks experiencing the same condition? We, we have two treatments. Uh, we have an ambient treatment where it's just normal seawater um, being pumped in straight from the reef here. And the other one is one with CO2 being bubbled in. So it allows us to have a control and see, be able to compare um, these ambient tanks to these ones being subjected to more acidic conditions. And can you tell me what 
kinds of organisms I'm looking at here inside the tank? So the coral, little coral nubbins there are massive parietes. They are a very common coral that you find on the back reef here and distributed uh, very, very common across the Pacific. And then there's uh, some other macroalgae in here. The yeah. macroalgae is the, the large kind of algae. Yeah, they're in the cages to avoid them kind of dissipating in the tank. The coral reef is a highly competitive place and coral species engage in competition with one another in a variety of ways. Algae also competes with coral for space on the reef. Nicholas and his colleagues are studying how ocean acidification will affect the competition between algae and coral. Ocean acidification makes it difficult for calcified organisms like corals to grow and form their skeletons. Scientists predict that ocean acidification will lead to a decrease in coral growth rates, resulting in algae overgrowing the coral reefs. These are some of the main macroalgae that you find out on the reef and that have been observed competing with this coral massive parietes out on the back reef. Mm -hmm. And so um, they've got, uh, we've got pairings that have been set up here to see how over time if one overgrows the other or shows clear signs of overgrowth onto the other and if um, ocean acidification or more acidic water may change the relationship between the two and change the um, competitive ability of each of them. So they're next to each other on purpose? Yeah, they've been tied together so that they form a pair and therefore you can see um, if there's a shift in the competitive dynamics between them basically. The University of Hawaii's Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. You're watching Voice of the Sea. Welcome back. We're looking at the effects of ocean acidification on algae and coral. They can physically try to overgrow each other and they can engage in a sort of chemical warfare. Nick's research shows that corals already engaged in competition may be better able to survive our changing climate. And what have you guys observed so far? Some of these macroalgae are favored. The, the trend is for corals to be negatively affected and some of the macroalgae to be positively affected. With the decreased pH. With the decreased pH. That, can, that could cause a change in the um, community structure out on the reef if some uh, organisms are being benefited over others. And what about with respect to the corals? Are there any species that are doing better um, or not being as harmed by the influx of CO2? Certain corals are more negatively affected by others, so there is, there is some positive news to come out of, of a lot of the research. The first, first few papers that came out were very negative about the effects of ovarian corals and, and quite doom and gloom, but a lot of the work coming out now is, is showing that certain species may pro are proving to be more hardy than others. And so that's another um, interesting thing to consider is maybe even amongst coral species there might be a shift in what you find out on the reef. It might not be that the reefs are completely barren in 100 years from now, but there might be just um, less diversity and, and certain, certain uh, tougher corals might dominate the reef a lot more. And your own research, is, is this part of your own research? Uh, this is from uh, colleagues of mine. My personal research actually looks at coral-coral interactions and seeing how that's affected by OA. So I've been looking at some of the dominant corals from the four reef here, so Postolopora and Acropora. So I'm trying to see how competitive abilities of various corals might be affected differently by ocean acidification, because as I said, certain corals are more affected than others, and therefore that may cause a shift in these competitive hierarchies that were established 30, 40 years ago. So that's my main focus, and trying to relate that back to community structure and seeing how and it may affect community structure. And how did you study that? Um, I had similar style of pairings, but with various corals. And I was using the flumes to, to mimic the conditions out on the fore reef. 
And so we'll be able to control uh, flow as well as the light, the temperature, and bubbling in pure CO2 to lower the pH once again. And so I had various pairings together and I was measuring the growth rates of the corals, the uh, calcification rates, the linear extension rates, so how fast they're growing overall and how fast they're expanding outwards. And uh, yeah, I was just wrapped up that experiment actually, so hopefully there'll be some good results from it. At first glance, you can't tell the difference between these two mesocosms right here, but this one has an ambient pH versus this one that has a pH around 7.7, .7, which is about a thousand micro atmospheres of PCO2 and a negative, one of the negative scenarios um, predicted for the end of the century. And so in terms of the dynamics between macroalgae and corals, you could expect that uh, these have been in for a couple of weeks now. And over time, you would expect that the more acidic conditions would favor the macroalgae that use up the bicarbonate or the CO2. And whereas there would be a decreased growth rate for the corals. So over time, you'd expect maybe to see more overgrowth from the algae onto the coral in the more acidic conditions. So I actually yeah. do see more algae growing at the base of the corals, but I you don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if it's significant, but there's, like I don't, I see algae waving around on these coral and I don't see any algae waving around at the base of these. The base of those, yeah. I mean, there is the possibility that the corals would be more prone to overgrowth by algae, whether it's macroalgae or turf algae. So there's a reduced growth rate for corals under more acidic conditions. And on top of that, therefore, they're more susceptible to overgrowth by algae that are being favored by these more acidic conditions. And so it could be doubly negative, basically, for the corals, with not only ha struggling to grow at normal rates, but also with the promotion of algal growth, then they would uh, be more prone to being overgrown themselves. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Welcome back. We're at the Gump Research Station in French Polynesia, comparing experimental ocean acidification treatments and weighing coral to measure its growth. So in, in addition to just observing them, how will you um, measure the difference between the, t the conditions or, or the effect of the conditions yeah. on the two tanks? Uh, so when I say that uh, coral growth has been reduced by ocean acidification, the main way in which we me measure that is simply by weighing the corals. And that gives us an idea of the calcification rate of the coral. So basically how much of the skeleton they've deposited over time. And that has been shown to be decreased. And that's the main measure of growth that we look at in corals. So is the coral actually going to shrink or is it just not going to grow as fast? Yeah, it's a reduced growth rate. It's still growing. Uh, luckily conditions aren't predicted to be as bad to the point where there'd be dissolution of the coral skeleton, but there's definitely a reduced, reduced growth rate in a lot of the corals that have been studied. And, and for algae, it's a similar thing. We, we, you can weigh them, you can dry weigh them and see and measure the growth rate of the algae. And we can also look at, over in longer experiments, you can start to see tissue death uh, on the coral near the algae. So the algae will start to smother the coral tissue and kill off some of the coral tissue, which is an even, more, uh, an even worse effect of, of the algal overgrowth. The idea of having a control and not only do we have the control tanks in itself, but within the tanks you have control pairings. And so this is to distinguish between is it an effect of the actual algae or just the effect of the presence of an object next to it. And so that's a control in a sense, just having some um, some material there to act as a control. And how long have these experiments been running now? These have been running for just over two weeks and they're going to have them running for about a month. So yeah, we, we try and have our experiments run around a month. It's still short term right now, but uh, moving ahead is definitely the plan to try and extend experimental time to 
multiple, like to a few months, even up to a year. Um, and then also trying to migrate these type of experiments out onto the reef. So that's an interesting thing because in the tank you're able to add CO2 which mimics environmental conditions, it affects the pH, but how do you change the CO2 content in the ocean water out on the reef? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot trickier. It, it basically comes down to having setups, um, just long flumes that have seawater pumping into them, which has been mixed with CO2 beforehand. And so that would then flow into them. So they're placed in the water, but they're still in a closed environment because obviously if it was completely open, then the CO2 would just mix in with the rest of the seawater and you wouldn't be able to maintain those conditions. So there's been various attempts to do it. People have these kind of little tents that they put out on the reef around corals, which traps the water in it and lets light in. But it's very difficult to try and, and make that transition from this controlled environment to controlling that, this type of environment on the reef. So yeah, that's the next step. Better technology would be, uh, would be the key to that. Until technology allows Nick to take the extreme conditions he is studying to the open ocean, he's confined to mimicking future ocean conditions in the lab. Nick is trying to understand the effect of ocean acidification on coral's ability to grow outward or linearly and occupy more real estate on the reef. More recently it's been, especially when looking at competitive interactions, linear extension of a coral is very important because they use the sunlight obviously in the, to photosynthesize and so to acquire space out on the reef they need to grow out linearly and so one thing that I've been trying to look at with my work is measuring calcification seeing how fast the coral grows but also measuring through time-lapse photography measuring the um, linear extension of the coral to see that if there is a redu reduction in calcification rate does that also mean that the coral isn't growing out as much? It isn't extending linear. It's not able to like maintain or take up more real estate. Exactly. Competition for space is a key thing out on the reef. That's one of the key drivers of the community structure. And so if, if a coral isn't able to grow and extend outwards, it's not able to compete for space. And that could prove very important for the corals if they're unable to, to compete for space on the reef. So yeah, those are the two main measures is just overall growth, but then also looking at the linear growth of the coral. So you're not too interested in measuring how high it gets? It's, it's tricky because some of these corals, um, some of them are more massive forms, rounder, whereas the corals I was looking at were branching. And so it's, it's, it's tough to see, not only are they competing for space, just as plants would be in, in, in the forest, is they're competing for space outwards, but also competing for space upwards. And so I was trying to measure the overall height of the colony and seeing how much they're growing upwards and also seeing how much they're extending. So there, there are various measures of growth that you can look at and that all answer different questions about how the coral's being affected by ocean acidification or being affected by comp competition or anything like that. So ex can you explain to me how the flume works? Yeah. So. With these flumes, we're able to control the flow rate quite well, uh -huh. which can be very important for corals and algae because a higher flow rate means that the boundary layers around the organism become thinner as the flow rate increases. So if they have more flow, then they're going to be better off? Or? Yeah, they're going to be better off. These flumes, we built them last year. There are four of them. And the idea is that we, can have, we have two of them that have been set up with um, a CO2 bubbling system. So we're able to lower the pH of two of the flumes to, in a similar style to the mesocosms and being able to uh, lower the pH and control the pH. And not only do, do the flumes allow us to increase the number of organisms that we can fit in them because they're obviously much larger, but we can control the flow a lot better. So we can really adjust the flow rate and try and mimic the flow rate that's out on the reef or try and vary the flow rate to see how flow may uh, be positively be helpful or have a negative effect on the organisms. And we also have a natural lighting out here, which is an extra, um, an extra step towards having more realistic conditions that you'd find out on the reef with the natural light cycle. 
You had your corals set up here similarly to what we saw in the mesocosm. Yeah, so I, I had my corals in various uh, types of pairings. I had a central coral, so the fore reef is currently recovering really well. And one of the main corals that's out there is Postolopera. Postolopera meandrina or Postolopera varicosa are two of the main species that you can get out there. And so the point of my experiment was to get Postolopera and have various types of competitive um, surroundings around it and see how interspecific or intraspecific interactions uh, affected the growth of the coral. So I had it surrounded by conspecific, so other Postoloperas, and I also had it surrounded by Acropora hyacinthus, which is another main branching coral that's found out on the fall reef and historically a very important coral, very abundant coral out on, on the fall reef when reefs were back in the 70s and 80s when coral reefs were much, uh, had a much higher coral cover. And I'm trying to, I was trying to see how different surroundings of a coral would affect its growth. So if a coral were to settle randomly on the fore reef, what happens if it settles next to corals of the same species or corals of different species? And a cropper is a much faster grower. It's a more aggressive coral. And so I'm trying to see if, if that would lower its growth rate considerably and seeing if there might be an interactive effect of OA. So if, oh, I'm sorry, ocean acidification. So if ocean acidification is more, uh, negatively affects a cropper more than Postolopera, then maybe the negative effects of a cropper overgrowing it might be, not, might not be as significant. And so I'm trying to see if um, this could translate as a shift in, in the community structure in a different environment. So if, if the reef, if these corals were growing uh, 50 to 100 years from now in more acidic conditions, then would the dynamics between the corals be different? And would that therefore translate in a different community composition out on the reef? We might see less acropora and more postolopora, or the other way around, there might be um, even different species that thrive under these different conditions. A lot of the faster growing corals are branching corals, such as acropora mm -hmm. and postolopora. And these provide refuges for a lot of fish, juvenile fish, to live amongst the branches. So if it is true that ocean acidification affects these more, these larger branching corals, uh, these faster growing branching corals, then you'll find less branching corals and there'll be less um, structure to the reef. Which is which, important as fish habitat. Right, so there'll be less refuges for fish and just overall aesthetic appearance. It's, it's not as nice. There won't be those beautiful large branching corals in it, maybe as much anymore. Corals that re rely on fast growth might be, have been shown to be more negatively affected by ocean acidification and that could be very vital information to know when trying to imagine what the reefs will be like in 100 years from now. So I think, yeah, one of the main things that ocean, acidific ocean acidification could do is, is it could decrease the abundance of branching corals and there's faster growing corals and that in turn would reflect on fish communities and uh, provide less refuges for various other organisms that use those corals as a habitat. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.